Joel Evans from the uh, business school. I think that most of you know who I am. Uh, I am glad to uh, welcome you to uh, the event tonight uh, with uh, Mr. Brandon Steiner on finding your entrepreneurial spirit. Um, if you want to get food, if you could please get it now and then come back, or rather than going back and forth in between, we have this great fudge. It's delicious. Uh, to start things off, I'd like to introduce uh, our Dean, uh, Dean Soshi. Well, you better know who I am, boy. You're in trouble. You won't graduate. But thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you, Professor Everett, for organizing this. This guy is a, uh, an amazing speaker, and his, his biography is absolutely amazing when Professor Evans introduces him. It's not just about the business he has now, but uh, his journey and how he reinvented himself over and over again. It's really, really amazing. And as you can see, he's a take charge kind of guy. So he's looking at me like, I better get out of here quick because he wants to take over. Not at all. Take your time. That's okay. So uh, you're going to do the introduction, right, Tom? So? Okay. So thank you all for coming, and remember, these are the events that enrich your education. You learn just as much outside as inside, and so keep reading the Wall Street Journal, and keep coming to these events, and keep listening to this guy over here, because uh, he's pretty good. Thank you. So I would like to thank everybody for coming. I would like to thank the Dean for uh, being here. I'd like to, uh, to thank uh, Lisa Kellerman and Barbara Church Catan for what they've done. I'd like to thank Kevin Taylor, uh, Patricia Salama, and uh, Claudia for, for what she's done. I'd like to thank Larry Wurzel, who's a, uh, an old student of mine, uh, who uh, brought the fudge, he made the fudge donation, and I thank him for that. And I wanted to, and as I said, for those of you that, that didn't come in before, it's, it's, it's uh, guilt-free calories, so if you have it, there's no guilt. And I'd also like to thank Scott Klein for helping to arrange for Mr. Steiner to be here tonight. Thank you, Scott. So let me introduce Mr. Steiner. Uh, and normally I'd make this really brief, but his, his background is so fascinating that I'm going to do a couple minutes. As this poor kid uh, in Brooklyn, Brandon Steiner scrounged tickets together, it scrounged enough change to make the subway trip to Yankee Stadium, buy the cheapest ticket available, and bask in the aura of his favorite baseball team for a couple of hours. Some people who grow up Yankee fans, some don't. <laughs> I get a reaction on that, but okay. Raised in Flatbush with his two brothers by a single mother, Brandon attended John Dewey High School in Coney Island, and, went, and from there went to Syracuse, where he graduated with an accounting degree. He started out in food, and this is where you know, being an entrepreneur and trying to understand the world around us and, and look for opportunities really sticks out. Started in f uh, food service and hospitality, managing a hospital cafeteria in Baltimore. From there he moved to a brand new Hyatt and that city's refurbished Inner Harbor. After his time at the Hyatt, Brandon moved back to New York where he served as the manager at the Hard Rock Cafe in the late 1980s, when it was easily one of the most popular restaurants in the city. It was there that Brandon began meeting many of the athletes he would later represent professionally. He met still more athletes at the ne next restaurant he managed, the Sporting Club, which was New York's first full-service sports bar. It was there that he made his first foray into sports marketing, hiring athletes as guest bartenders for charity events and to show up as guests of honor to fight nights where the bar would, would uh, air satellite broadcasts of big-time uh, boxing matches. As he got to know athletes, Brandon learned that they did not have anyone to represent them for speaking engagements and corporate appearances. To fill that void, he started Steiner Associates, which is now Steiner Sports, in 1987. And again, this is a good lesson here, with $4,000, that's all he started with, a one-room office and an intern. Over the years, the business slowly but steadily grew, and by the late 1990s, Steiner Sports comprised dozens of employees and represented most of the big-time athletes in, in uh, New York sports scene. In 2003, he published his first book, The Business Playbook, Leadership Lessons from the World of Sports. Um, perhaps Brandon's biggest home run to date was his 2004 deal with the Yankees, which provides uh, Yankee fans with authentic Yankee memorabilia and one-of-a-kind fantasy experiences at Yankee Stadium. He followed this with partnerships with Notre Dame football, Syracuse Athletics, and uh, Madison Square Garden. In 2008, he created another unique market, if I get this one, buying the exclusive rights 
to the old Yankee Stadium. So he basically owns every piece in Yankee Stadium to be able to be resold as a collectible. Um, outside the office, he has become a permanent fixture in the media and is a regular on ESPN radio, uh, along with co-hosting Yankee Steiner Memories of the Game. He devotes most of his free time to charities, including Family Services of Westchester, which provides uh, social and mental health services uh, to strengthen uh, families and children. And in 2012, Wiley published his second book, which is the one that's uh, outside there, You've Got to Have Balls, which chronologues his long career and the life and business lessons he learned therein. So let us please welcome this. First of all, pleasure to be here. Blessing, thank you for having me. I always like to get back. I'm, you know, in the first book I spoke at about 60 schools. Always promised, uh, you know, I, when I graduated college, I think I applied to about 200 jobs. I have a whole thing, I, I'm gonna get into my blog a little bit later, but I have a whole thing about finding work and finding a job. I'm sure a lot of you are nervous and you know, anxious to get your careers going. But after 200 rejections, I'd say, you know, I'm just show you the, the arrogance to some degree. At the same time, I was out of my mind, shingles and everything else, uh, really nervous because I didn't, I didn't think my career was going to go anywhere. You know, I had this restaurant experience and 200 rejection letters. I said, when I figure this out, how to get this work stuff, when I figure out how to go find work, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to go back and explain you know, to kids um, how to do that, you know, how to find work. So, you know, I, I, was, I wrote a blog the other day about, you know, how to find work. And uh, I, you know, I have 40 years I'm looking for work. And I'm getting, you know, I'm getting good at it. <laughs> um, and I, I think it's an important thing, you know, before I get into the story, it is an important thing for you all to know is, you know, it's not like, it's, you know, when I graduate, I'll get better. You, know, you, you gotta figure out how to get good at finding work now. Because it's something you're gonna be doing the rest of your life. And the people that are really good at it do really well. A very simple concept, you know, finding work and getting work is, you know, getting a job is a job. It's a good thing to tell your parents. Get a job, but, you know, finding a job is a job. So, uh, and that's an important lesson learned. Um, it's been an incredible journey. You know, sometimes I look back, and, and this year has been a really look back year, besides coming out with the second book. As I always recommend, if you, if you email me, I'll probably send you the cop, first copy of the book, because I think it's that important at this stage for you to read the first book. The second book's great, it's a quick read, it's an easy read, you can read a couple chapters here or there, and you'll understand after we have this conversation why you're gonna to wanna to pick it up and read it. This is a little bit of a game changer for you. You'll be able to relate to a lot of it. But it's been a great journey and I've been able to really reflect. I'm not one of those guys who really, I'm not a big celebrator of success. I just always think there's more, and I have this big saying about what else. So. But this is my 25th, you know, my 25th anniversary, 24 years married to my wife. Um, hell of a sale I made 24 years ago. <laughs> um, trust me on that, we're gonna talk about that value proposition. You know, this is important to learn. Sometimes, you know, you, you do need to create value proposition even when it comes to finding your significant other. So that's important. Um, but 25 years when you look back, it's hard to have something stick. It's hard to do something that actually people want appreciate and like 25 years in a row. So it's, it's such a blessing and uh, you know, I have my Steiner store right over here in Roosevelt Field, if any of you have been in there. And uh, that was just a complete luck. Kind of one of the best transactions I had made, but um, so I'll get into that story a little bit too. Um, I just want to start off with a little bit of my beginning because people always say, my friend, how'd you do it? How, how, how this, you know, how, 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 how does this all come about? You know, four thousand bucks. You start this business. Now it's you know it's a fifty million dollar business, and I made a few shekels along the way. Um, and it starts. You know, I'm in, I'm in uh, fifth grade. Um, at the time, I lived over a Clark Kosher Butcher, Kings Highway, right in the middle of Brooklyn. Uh, Kings Highway is a long strip of. Uh, it's just a lot, a lot of people in a small amount of space. You know, when you talk about Brooklyn and that particular area, apartment buildings, and you know. If you, you know, you're one of your neighbors had a cold, you know, you would yell, God bless you, you know, from your apartment to theirs. <laughs> you know, you knew when, you know, when there were fights and squabbles going on. I lived over a Glock kosher butcher, and that's where the chickens get killed on premise. You know, that in order to be Glock kosher, the chickens had to be killed in the butcher shop. So usually every morning I'd wake up and, Brad, Brad, and cut the chickens' heads off. 
so you know, it wasn't a great environment, you know, to grow up. Um, you know, and I tell people all the time, I saw the light at an early age. Uh, unfortunately, it was a refrigerator light because that refrigerator was empty. I mean, you know, we grew up on welfare most of my uh, childhood in a single parent home and really just trying to survive. And uh, it really kind of came around for me back to fifth grade. Uh, Mr. Kerber was my teacher, fifth grade. And Mr. Kerber was my after school teacher. I had a little relationship with him. You know, that's where we went after school. I mean, anywhere but home, because home was cold, no food, nobody was home. So, you know, we always tried to play after school. And uh, Mr. Kerber called me up in front of the class and gave me an envelope of money. And I said, well, what, what is this for? He said, well, we took a collection uh, for you to buy some clothes. I said, well, why do you think, I, why, why, why would you think I need clothes? He says, well, you've been wearing the same pants for three weeks in a row. I said, well, how, how would you know that? He said, we have a rip in the right knee. So I went home, and uh, you know, you gotta have balls, is my mother's favorite line, by the way. <laughs> the book is dedicated to her, and it's really not a sports book. It's a lot of the lessons I've learned. So this was the first one, which was, Mom, you know, they gave me this money, and I'm humiliated, I was crying, I was upset. And of course she was like, you know, you're in between sizes, you know, we're waiting, and you know, all this rhetoric. But you know, I wore mostly hand-me-downs most of my childhood from cousins and relatives that were going to close over in the house. And uh, so, you know, she gave me this kind of, you know, half, half a story answer. So the next day I just remember going to my mom's room and said, listen, you know, uh, Saturday, not 10. Now I know a lot of you are probably 18, 19, 20, so 10 years old is a lot sooner. You, know, you can remember 10, and I can remember 10, but 10 years old, mom, I'm going to find a job on Saturday. I'm going to go find a job. So I have trouble getting my 10 year old just to get up and go down to eat breakfast <laughs> and clean up his room. I'm going to take care of myself going forward. And if I have some extra money, I'll, I'll kind of kick that in to help the family. Well, uh, Saturday morning, I woke up at around 7.30 a.m., hit the streets. Now, if you know King's Highway, there's these hundreds of retail stores, and I didn't really stop until I found Freddie the Fruit Man. Freddie the Fruit Man was this, you know, in those days, a lot of little fruit and vegetable stores, unlike now with the Koreans, and you go to a supermarket, you go to a small fruit and vegetable store to buy your fruit and vegetables, and I stocked and delivered fruit and vegetables. That was my first job. Quarter to seven on every Saturday morning, once in a while, he'd work me during the week, hour 50 an hour, I was rolling, 10 years old. Now, you probably think how that story relates to you, and, and really what it comes down to is like, I think everyone has that aha moment where they decide that they're gonna be accountable. You may have had it, you may haven't had it yet, but there's that day where you say, I'm accountable, I'm gonna go after what I need to go after, and I'm gonna get it done, and nothing's gonna get in my way. For me, it happened when I was 10. You can imagine, that's a very young age, to go hit the streets, even to have the balls to go get a job at 10, which is, can't imagine what my neighbors were thinking, and then to go land one at 10, and then keep it. So to kind of roll forward a little bit, so you know, I've got, I've got accountability and dependability. I decided around, I think I was about 13 now, and I, you know, I put a few cookie stands and lemonade stands out of business, you know, no sense keeping them around, but I decided to make some lemonade, sell some cookies. You know, whatever it was, giving out flyers underneath the L, you know, selling fireworks, you know, whatever I could do. I had a bunch of different rackets going on. So 13, I'm like, you know, I love sports. I want to play sports. I can't be working every afternoon. I got to find a job in the morning so I could play ball with all my friends and everything. I don't want to miss that time. So at 13, I decide I'm going to open up a paper route. You know, I take over a route. And there's this contest also. Whoever opens up the most accounts can win this box of candy bars. Now, you haven't got to tell me twice cock box of candy bars. I mean, I'm all in. <laughs> so I decided to open up, you know, get my paper rock going, because I could wake up like six in the morning, and then I have the whole afternoon to kind of play around and do what I want to do. But I only got 29 dailies when I took over the route, and 34 Sundays. And that was not a lot of money. You know, paper back then was eight cents per day to pick up the daily news. So I'm walking up and down the streets, as I mentioned earlier, these big apartment buildings, and I'm saying, hey, all these people, some of them, they got to they got to get the paper from me. So I go and I start knocking on doors. And I run into this woman, she's probably about 65 years old. And I see, you know, well, you know with older people, they tend to save things. So, you know, she got the, you know, they have the newspaper stacked up inside the door. And so I knew that she was getting the paper. I'm like, wow, this lady's definitely getting the paper from me. So I told her about my services. Yeah, I'm not interested. Man, 
Well, I see you got the Daily News every day. I mean, he goes, yeah, but I go to the corner store and get it. I said, but it's the same price if you get it from me or the corner store. He says, yeah, but then I got to tip you. I go home. I said, Mom, this is insane. People are looking at me. It's unbelievable. People don't want to tip me. I'm going to deliver this newspaper every morning by 7. He says, you know, you got to differentiate yourself. It's not just always about selling things. So, you know, I continue knocking on our doors, and I go back to the woman. And I knock on our door, and I said, man, I've been thinking about you. I'm very concerned. You know, a woman of your age, if there's a blizzard, snowing, heat wave, bad rain, you should be out in that kind of weather. If I bring you milk and bagels every Wednesday and Sunday, hot bagels on Sunday morning and milk on Wednesdays and Sundays, because when the weather's really bad, no matter what, you know you have to have your milk, and you know you're going to want your bagels on Sunday morning. Would you then get the paper delivered? You would do that for me. I said, you're not concerned. You should be out. <laughs> this kind of weather, I'm rain, shine, doesn't matter. 7 a.m., I'm later, you don't have to pay me. So, you know, you know you want to get your paper, and the weather's bad, you, work, you automatically need to get the paper, and you can get your milk. I love that. Thank you so much. Little did I know is this woman knew everyone. I went from 29 dailies to 199 dailies, 234 Sundays, two shopping carts every Sunday of Sunday daily news. I was rock and rolling. And I tell you that story and how you can relate to that story is value proposition is everything. And that little story when people ask me about, well, how'd you get this Steiner thing going? Well, it's value proposition. And I've used this small little lesson learned 30 different ways to Sunday, landing Derek Jeter, landing the Yankee Steiner, you getting Notre Dame to do a partnership with me. There's value proposition, if there's anything I teach you today and talk about today, it's the most important thing in marketing and learning and selling is to be diligent about what the other person needs. It's not only what you have to sell. It's not only about differentiating yourself, but understanding what that person you're trying to sell to really, really needs. And then taking the knowledge and taking what you have and carving that out to match up with what the person needs. And in this particular case, as a 13-year-old, pretty good. Probably didn't even know what I was doing, just instinctively to do that with my mother's guidance. But when you think about it, from sitting there with Derek Jeter, the last thing Derek Jeter really needs is Brandon Steiner. I mean, he's Derek Jeter. Even in 96, he was Derek Jeter. Or we even moving over to the Yankees. You know, the fact that the balls, you know, to think about Yankees and Steiner in one word is insane. You know, I mean, even at that time, I was a decent-sized company, but that was. But at the end, it was the value proposition. It was like, you've got all this product, you've got all this stuff in your clubhouse. What are you doing with it all? Who's securing that all? And then down the road, a big concern of the Yankees was the security of it. So, you know, are the are their fans getting this stuff, and is it real? So my value proposition was. Let me help you secure that. Now, can I make a lot of money for Steiner? And how can I get a, a sign in center field? But how can I secure this product and make sure your fans are safe? How can we put something together that creates order for you so that you sleep well at night when it comes to this sort of thing? And that was the value proposition that I learned at 13 years old. So it just, you know, the, the lessons learned is, you know, accountability. You know, the ability to be counted on. It's like I've always been a cat that's been accountable. You know why? Because I got accountable when I was 10. So, you know, you may want to ask yourself, you know, how accountable are you? How dependable are you? Because that stuff comes up later on, and it's not something you can kind of teach and take a quick dependability pill. You can't all of a sudden take an accountability pill. Okay, now I'm real. Now I'm serious. So now when you're in college, you're having a good time, the chicken wings, a little beer on a Friday night, or whatever it is, <laughs> I hear you. But a, and, and you should have some fun. But, but on the other hand, you won't be able to turn the accountability switch with remote control. You know, so have you had that moment? And then the other thing is how are you differentiating yourself according to the market that's going on? So when you talk about like reading the Wall Street Journal, which you know I've always struggled being a big reader. Today's world, which is great, you know, the Wall Street Journal I'm a fan of, the New York Times, but you have so much accessibility to be able to really cheat, frankly, in a good way. You have YouTube. You know, if you do want to, you know, you can go on WallStreetJournal.com. You have so many quick little blogs. You can go get the quick fix of, of information. You know, the world is your classroom. And everyone is a teacher. And there's so many vehicles of, to learn. And, and that's, you know, to really differentiate yourself, you know, you want to go follow the patterns of what's going on out there. It's not only what you're interested in. 
is trying to find the patterns of what's going on out there. It's a true entrepreneurial spirit. So you have what you're interested in, you, you follow that, and we'll talk about that in a minute, about the commitment you need to make to be really good at something, but you're always following the patterns. For me, I was always following the patterns of what was going on and trying to figure out one question. What else? What's missing? You know, I walk in this room, I'm so externally distracted, honestly, I'm, it's a problem for me, which I've had to cut down on some of the ball games, probably at about 100 events a year. And when I'm at it, I mean, I'm so sort of extremely distracted. Like, should the fudge been in there? Could have been together? Could have looked a little better? You know, the fruit's not really maybe displayed properly. Did I need the podium? Should I stand behind the podium? But what else is missing here? Is there something that can be made that's a little bit different? And that's really the question. So I kind of messed this up, sorry. So, you know, at the end, I'm always thinking, what else, what's missing is first to market. So, you know what I What else times what's missing is first to market? To me, being first to market has always been everything. I never want to be in second. And I get first to market by thinking, what else times what's missing? What else times what's missing could be anything. And there's been so many great inventions over the last 10 years, but they don't come overnight. They come from a constant pursuit of everywhere you walk in. You walk in a restaurant, What's missing? What else? You're in a, every store. You're in a classroom. How could it be easier to learn? How can I communicate with my teacher better? You know, you don't know where that entrepreneurial idea is going to come from. Here's the big mistake. So you know, you talk about accountability, dependability, the ability to be dependent on. You know, are you somebody that can be dependent on? Talk about the value proposition. You know, what's your value proposition? You know, what are you doing? What are you really passionate about learning about? And do you understand what's going on out there? And how that relates? That's a really interesting exercise. A big mistake that I think a lot of you make, and a lot of speakers that come in, they probably talk a lot about passion, right? Passion. You hear it all the time, you know, the P word, passion. It's bullshit. And I'm going to tell you why it's bullshit. Because everybody's running around trying to find passion. Everybody's trying to run around and say, I'll give you a better example. You got a boyfriend, you got a girlfriend, right? And you're trying to find that person that's you know, gonna whip you off of your feet. You wanna get passionate about this, this relationship. But at the end of the day, anything great that happens starts with a commitment. And you start using the C word, and a lot of people start running to the exits. The commitment word, who? And it's like, I'll tell you, you know, show me somebody that's really, really successful, and it starts with commitment. Now, when you start with commitment, commitment leads to passion. You're running around looking for passion, you're gonna have a lot of running around to do. You may find it, you may find some lightning in a bottle, you may get a lottery ticket, and all of a sudden some sparks you and hits you and you may get lucky. But the way you really find, lead, what leads you to passion is commitment. Make a commitment and be fully all in on something and you'll find yourself all of a sudden on the road to passion and you'll find your well, well where are you on the way to success. Now, before we get the commitment, before we get the passion, we should take one step back and you gotta look at an understanding. You have to have an understanding. So let's say I want to lose weight. I'm passionate about it, but I'm not committed about going on a diet. <laughs> so you know you gotta, you know, so you know, are you committed? Now the first thing I do is come up with an understanding. The understanding is that I'm gonna stop eating fudge. I'm gonna stop eating chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> You know, I'm going to make sure I eat really healthy in the morning. Now, these are the understanding part of it. It's not about going on a diet. It's about coming up with understanding. Now, you all made a commitment. It gives you an idea, which is why, just to put this in perspective, you were in high school. You decided not, you weren't passionate about going to the school. You didn't know from the school for that. You went on an interview. You went, maybe took a tour of the school. Could have been, could have been passionate about coming to the school. But you made a commitment. You made a commitment to come here made a commitment, some of you at that time, to get a certain degree. And because of that commitment, a lot of you are probably passionate about coming here, right? Now, here's the question. So you had to understand you were going to take X amount of classes in order to get a certain amount of credits in order to get your degree. So you have that understanding. So understanding slash moves to commitment, and then that commitment leads to passion. And you probably got passionate about what you're learning and what you're studying, and hence it's been a pretty good experience. But here's the one underlying factor. I kind of had the chalkboard here, which was understanding, commitment, passion, 
Underneath all of that is energy. So the question is, what energy are you bringing? What do you bring? I see people all the time that come to my office. I hire them. They spend eight months trying to get an interview with me, another eight months getting the job. They're committed, passionate about the opportunity to work for Steiner Sports, but their energy level sucks.